Praise the Lord. So let me just ask you a question. Is there anybody in your world who is like the least likely to ever come to church? You know, think about a friend or a coworker or a relative when they'd be like, you know, there ain't no way I'm stepping into a church. The, the, the roof will fall on my head if I, if I darken the doors of the church or whatnot. And um, if you saw that person in church and you said to them, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're here today. You know, wouldn't that be amazing? Maybe they'd say to you, I can't believe you're here. You know, and tell me your background. I mean, who knows? But um, if you ask them the question, hey, would you want to go to church with me? I'll pick you up. Come on, let's go to church. What would be their, that, that person that maybe is the furthest from maybe going to church? What would be their emotional response? If you can picture that. What would be their body language or maybe, you know, how, what would they conjure up in their face or whatnot? Just think about that for a second. And, um, and then think about inviting them. And, and bring them to church. But, you know, there, there's this process, this psychiatric, let's just do this for a minute, psychiatric evaluation process known as the word association method. Who's ever heard of that? Word association game? Probably more of you than, than raise your hands. But it works like this. I say a word, and then the first thing that comes to your mind, you then say, uh, you speak it out. It's like stimulating the associated processes in your mind or whatever. And so, the first thing that comes into your emotions or your mind, you speak it out. And if, if I was a psychiatrist and I asked you 100 different words and you gave me the immediate response, I could begin to analyze kind of how you're wired. That's just how that works. So let's just do it today. Let's do a massive psychotherapy here just for a minute. Are you ready? You know, I like the fall. I like Thanksgiving. So if I say the word turkey, you say what? I heard. I don't think I heard the word gravy. Gravy is the right answer, anyway. By the way, to that question. <laughs> Bacon would be acceptable. But gravy is the right answer. This is this is multiple choice. You got to get it right here. If I say New England Patriots, what do you say? I don't know. This, what if I say the word? If I say church, you say what? Well, let me just tell you, if you, to that friend who doesn't want to come to church, when you say church to them, they might think this, boring, like grandma, like obligation, religion, guilt, uh, nap time, maybe, <laughs> or just why would anyone want to do that? That's how people respond. And you know, if we were 100% honest here in this room, and we went around and passed the microphone and said, why are you here today? This might be some of the answers. Uh, I come to church because my parents make me come. Uh, I do it for my wife because it means a lot to her. How about that? I feel guilty if I don't come. Hmm. Uh, there are pretty single girls there that I want to meet. Might be somebody. There's free coffee and donuts afterwards. Uh, I'm looking for a husband. Might be somebody's response. I'm looking for some new business contacts, perhaps. And I was just raised in a church, and that's just what I do. Or I'm not really sure why I'm here. Somebody invited me, so I showed up. And there's a lot of reasons and a lot of motivations but for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to try to give us a little higher purpose and a higher calling for being in church. Thank you, Jesus. Coming to church for all the right reasons. You know, King David was this great worship leader in Israel. And when he was invited to church, I'm going to read his response, which I hope can become all of our responses. It's from Psalm uh, 122. And King David said, uh, let me turn this thing back on. Anyway, so King David, a great worship leader, he's invited to church, and his response, oh my gosh, is this out of batteries? What in the world? Are you kidding me? Okay, here we go, here we go. A key part of church is being really technically savvy and smooth and not having any hiccups along the way and whatever. But anyway, this is what David said. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Come on. He's like, give me an invitation. I'll be there. I'll get there. I'm happy to be there. Praise the Lord. So we're talking about church. And uh, when we read through the scriptures about church, we'll find passages like this in Ephesians where it says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And you might think, well, what? You know, I think of a church as a church building. But what really is the church? You know, it's not just some ethereal kind of floaty thing out there that you can't quite put your finger on. It's not some spiritual entity with no physical reality. Here would be a definition of the church. The church is the called out ones who have been called together. If you look at the Greek language, uh, the Greek word for church has those two meanings. We've been called out of something 
called out of the world and the world's way of doing everything, and we've been called together. How many know that God doesn't call people out just to be Lone Ranger Christians all by themselves? It, it doesn't work that way. You know, sometimes I talk to people and they're like, hey, it's just me and Jesus and we got it going on and it's a great thing, it's wonderful. And um, you know what? Actually, when you're called out, God doesn't call you out into isolation. He doesn't call you out by yourself. He calls you together with other people. He calls you out of a world of darkness and he connects you to his church and to his body and that's what the church is. Hallelujah. Can we say amen to that? So there's a bunch of verses in the book of Ephesians that we're gonna look at for a few minutes. Here's, here's one of them in Ephesians 2. Together, we are his house. Can we just read that? Together, we are his house. Built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself, and we are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. When we read that first line, together we are his house, doesn't it seem clear that apart from one another, we are, not the, we are not the same house individually as we are when we're together. Together we are his house. And here, here's the interesting thing. Many of the promises in the New Testament associated with the church and associated with the Holy Spirit doing things are more aligned with the church as a congregation as a whole than they are with individual believers. That's just an interesting way to go, go at things. Jesus says things like, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in their midst. Seems like he's in, in our midst in a different way than we're just when we're isolated and alone. That's why church is so powerful. When we come, we get connected, we get in connect groups because there are promises, there are certain promises in the word of God that will never be fulfilled outside of the greater body of Christ. Together we are his house. We are carefully joined together in him. Hallelujah. I think that's a really good point right there. I'm just gonna underscore that. The word in the Greek language for church is a word ecclesia. It's used 115 times in the New Testament and it means an assembly of people is all it means. But, but the assembly wasn't ethereal and it wasn't spiritual. It was identifiable. It was a group of people. They gathered together to worship and preach the word and feed the hungry and baptize new Christians and take communion together and encounter Jesus and share his love and transform the world. Praise the Lord. The church is just an assembly, a group of people. And in those 115 times that it's used in the New Testament, it is never referencing an individual person. It is always a group of people and that's the big deal. You've been called out for a purpose and to be connected to others for a purpose. We're part of something bigger than just our individual selves. You're part of the church of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let me just read a passage from the life of Christ that's uh, kind of an interesting one from John chapter two. It says this, Jesus went into the temple and, uh, or went into Jerusalem and in the temple area, he saw merchants settling cattle, selling Cattle, sheep, doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. And Jesus made a whip with some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. And he drove out the sheep and the cattle and scattered the money changers' coins all over the floor and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold the doves, he said to them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Oh my gosh, so here's Jesus, he comes into the temple, they're buying and selling stuff, and he kind of flips out, right? He makes this whip, he starts overturning tables and starts w using this whip to drive out the animals and whatnot, and I'm sure the disciples are probably thinking, Jesus is having a bad day here. This isn't going well, I don't know what happened, he got up on the wrong side of the bed, we've never seen this side of him. But th that side of him was actually called holy anger or righteous zeal. And then the, the disciples who are watching this remembered something from Psalm 69. It says, the disciples remembered this prophecy in the scriptures, zeal for God's house will consume me. So in other words, there was this passion in the life of Jesus that he so loved God's house that would drive and motivate him to just love it and protect it and keep watch over it. And we believe in a vision here at Wellspring for the local church. There's a lot of great churches in the Upper Valley, and maybe you're not called to Wellspring Worship Center, but we believe you're called to one of the churches and to be involved and be connected, and we just have passion to see God's ministry accomplished both in this church and in the Upper Valley. Praise the Lord. Let me just make this statement. The local church is a big deal to God, and so it's a big deal to us.
Hallelujah. We feel strongly about the local church. Did you know the local church is the only institution given the mandate to bring the gospel to the world? It's the only institution empowered with the message by the Holy Spirit, with the authority, the delegated authority by God to advance the kingdom of God. He does that advancement through his church. My goal today is that we would all increase our passion and maybe even increase our commitment to a local church. Hallelujah. And I'm also believing that the Holy Spirit could bring some healing here this morning. You know, there's people in this room who've been through some dysfunctional churches, maybe some blow-ups along the way, maybe some abuses along the way. And I, I just want us all to get a fresh glimpse of God's church and his plans for our church. Praise the Lord. You know, um, have you ever had this conversation with somebody at work or a friend or whatever, and they say, hey, you know what? I just don't care for organized religion at all. You know, I never have. I probably never will. And um, I don't really know what that means when someone says that. You know, I don't, I don't believe in organized. You know, what do they believe in? Disorganized religion? I mean, come on. Do they want disorganized medical care? Do they want disorganized education or disorganized banking systems or whatever? I mean, I don't think Jesus would ever say, I don't actually care much for organized religion. Because look at this verse from Luke chapter 4. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, and let me highlight this, as was his custom. So his custom was every week on Saturday, he went to the Sabbath, or he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Did you know that during his time on earth, he just faithfully attended what some people would call a corrupt system and corrupt services, and have you ever thought about that? That system that he supported and was a part of actually turned on him and killed him. And then what he did is he said, well, I'm just going to build my own church, and it's going to be built on the faith of flawed people, unfortunately. And you might think, well, why would he ever build the church on the faith of flawed people? And the answer is uh, so that you and I could have a place to go to church. Are you kidding me? Without that, have you ever heard the old saying that says, if you find the perfect church, what do you do? You don't join it, because if you join it, you're going to ruin it. Are you kidding me? We just are in a church where we all have flaws, we all have some issues along the way. And, um, and I understand as a pastor that there's people coming from really bad church experiences probably uh, in this room. In fact, sometimes people in church are really good at judging and bringing shame and hurting people and maybe abandoning people who need help. And you know there's hypocrisy in the church. But uh, you come to realize that there's pretty much hypocrisy everywhere. I mean, right, I mean, I don't want to give people excuses or whatnot, but if you think logically, I'm not going to let the abuse of something turn me away from the good in something that's going on. Praise the Lord. There, thank you, Jesus. Let me just shift gears here for a minute. So things to know about the church. Let's just say this. The church is God's plan. It's God's idea. And so, you know, you might think if you watch the news or you watch some stuff on YouTube and from people who've had bad church experiences, you might think, you know what? Um, Church is just man's idea. Somebody wanted to make money and somebody wanted to do whatever. So they just organized this system and did it. And uh, the church has actually always been God's plan. It's his house. It's his blueprint. Here's an interesting story back in the Old Testament when uh, he pulls Moses aside to build the tabernacle and really build the nation of Israel, he says, hey, listen, Moses, I want to build for you a place where my presence dwells, where my authority dwells, and my name dwells, and here's the deal. Um, uh, you got to build it according to my pattern and my blueprint. So the color of the drapes, I get to pick that. And who does the ministry in that? I get to pick that too. Where the gold goes, I get to pick that too. And if you build it according to my pattern, my presence and power will be there. And Moses does just that, and the glory of God fills it. And the same thing happens when Solomon builds a temple a few hundred years later. When we follow instructions, things work out in God's timing and in God's plan. Hallelujah. So church is God's idea. It's his plan to have pastors Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, that's God's idea. It's his idea to have ministry leaders of ministry and elders in the church. That's God's idea. It's God's idea to have a large gathering like this and then have small connect group gatherings during the week. That's his idea. It's his idea to have communion together and to reach out to people and to preach the word and to have a time of worship. Those are God's ideas. And so the idea of church in general has been in God's heart from the very beginning. In fact, we can read this in Ephesians 3. I was chosen, this is Paul talking 
to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. Then he says, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom. Let me just highlight that. Was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan. Come on, this was God's plan from way back, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, so here's, the church shows up and Paul says, hey, this is what's been going on. It's been a little bit of a mystery, but this is how God actually wants to have his plan march through human history. It's through this thing called the church. And his wisdom and his power is revealed through actually through a group of people who are in the Lord Jesus themselves. It's more than just an organization of people. It's more than just a building. It's more than hearing a sermon. It's more than doing a new parking lot out there. Come on, it's actually the very presence and person of the Lord Jesus being revealed through his body of believers. It's been a mystery, Paul says, for a long time, but it's now being revealed. So in other words... It has always been in God's heart to have the church from all eternity. So point number one is the church is God's plan. That's just how, that's just, there's no other way around that. Praise the Lord. Here's number two. The church has God's guarantee of success. I'm just loving this. You know, if we build our lives around his plan according to his pattern, there is a guarantee of success. How many know we need that? I, I like guarantees. I like guarantees when they're successful. I'm telling you, if you've been on the planet for any length of time, you've experienced failure and maybe major failure. Failure here, failure there, failed marriages, failed dreams, failed churches, failed hell, failed along the way, and you've seen some failures. But here's a sure promise that the Lord gives us. He, God says, you know, if we in our heart can say this, Lord, I'm going to help build what you gave your life to build, let me just tell you, you will have guaranteed success in life. Now, now, maybe you've gone through some some rough trials and some things that kind of got your mind a little bit uh, uh, twisted around. You can't wrap your mind around things or whatnot, but you will be more than a conqueror. Your testimony at the end of your days, if if, if you pour into God's church, you say, I'm a part of God's church. I, I wanna be planted in God's church. You will be a conqueror at the end of the years. You will have success. You will move forward in your life. Here's what Jesus said about that guarantee. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Come on. That, that's a fairly sure promise there from the Lord. Praise God. I will build my, let's just read this together. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Hallelujah. It sounds to me like there's a guarantee of success right there if we're cooperating with Jesus as he builds his church. Thank you, Lord. Guaranteed. You know, if you think about certain governments, they come and go, right? They're temporary. Nations rise and fall. The Roman Empire, long gone. Babylonian Empire, long gone. You know, Soviet Union broke apart. Berlin Wall torn down. There are just empires that come and go. New England Patriots dynasty, long gone. Oh, my gosh. The empires, they come, they go. The dynasties, they come and go. But for for Bible-believing Christians who know this first, we're like, wait a minute, there is actually a promise for guaranteed success. And God says, I'm gonna build something that no force or no power and no ability will be able to stop. It's his church. And so we're encouraging you to get deeply planted in his church, whether this, this church or another church. Hallelujah, just be planted in it. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just want to make you aware of a question that at some point in your life you might ask yourself. Have you ever asked yourself this question? What am I building with my life? Jesus is building his church. Well, what are we building? And let me just tell you, I'm 56 years old. Is that how old I am? 57? Something like that. And uh, this question gets progressively clearer and louder the older you get. Oh my gosh, when you're in your teens, you couldn't care less, right? When, you, when you're in maybe college age, partying on spring break and doing whatever, couldn't care less. When you have to like consider five different careers in your 20s, you couldn't care less. But somewhere in your later 30s, you begin to think, hmm, what am I actually building with my life? 
And then when you get in your 40s, it gets a little bit louder. And then in your 50s, it gets a little louder. And uh, in that question, what am I really doing with my life? And unless you're living like in denial or in deception, you want to start answering the question. Like, what am I investing in? What, am, what is my life doing? What am I doing with my life? A am I, this is the question I like to ask myself. Am I investing in something eternal? Is what I'm doing having any eternal value? And, uh, you know, I'm not in my 60s or 70s yet, but I would imagine when you hit your 70s and 80s, the question is no longer, what am I building? But it's, what have I built, right? What have I invested in? And here's the thing, as sons and daughters of God, God wants you to invest in things of eternity. Thank you, Jesus. You know, actually, the devil hates when we're building things. He wants us just to sort of kind of sit around and complain. Did you know that, that builders and craftsmen, let me read kind of an a, a, a interesting passage from a prophetic book, the book of Zechariah. And in this book, these world powers have destroyed Jerusalem and some other things are going on. But let me just read what's going on here for a couple of verses in Zechariah chapter 1. Uh, Zechariah looks up, it says, and there before me were four horns. A horn like stood for strength back in the day, like powerful strength. And I asked this angel who was speaking with me, what are these? And he answered, these are the horns that scattered Judah and Israel and Jerusalem. So these powers that came against them and scattered them. And, and the Lord showed me four craftsmen, it says in the next verse. And I asked, what are these coming to do? And he answered, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could raise their head. But the craftsmen have come to terrify those horns and throw them down, the horns of the nations. So building, people who are focused on building things with God actually terrify the enemy. The enemy just wants you to sit back, just coast through life, don't do nothing. But when you get serious and say, no, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build something. I'm gonna partner with God and what he's doing with my life and build something with God. That terrifies the enemy. The, the craftsmen have come to terrify those, those beings, those powers, or whatever they are. It's like, let, let's get in a mode where we're actually cooperating with God and building the pattern he has for our lives. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The church has God's guarantee of success. Thank you, Jesus. Here's number three. The church is where spiritual growth takes place. Come on, our spiritual gifts are developed. Things happen. Uh, let me read a verse, another verse from Ephesians. God takes the whole body fit together perfectly, or makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I, I want to get this clearly over to you folks. Growth in the Christian walk requires connection with other people. Christians. Disconnected people, and I would imagine there'd be a few here that could take the mic and say, you know what, I disconnected from the church from, for five or ten years, and um, you know, during that time, I sort of bounced around, and I didn't see much spiritual growth going on, and not much was happening, because according to this verse, you were never designed to grow in isolation. We grow and we're connected to other parts of the body. So when we can, here's how it works. The, the gift that you have, the blessing that's going on in your life is needed by somebody else. And, and, and you need some things in other people. So praise the Lord. Get this here. The church isn't just about good sermons and a good worship set and some good ministries. It's about people who connect with each other and help each other grow in the Lord. We all need what you're carrying. The, the, there might be somebody in your row right now who has the exact thing you're looking for in life. They might have the prayers for you. They might have the anointing. They might have something going on in their life that you need. We need each other. Hallelujah. So if you're a spectator and you need to be on the field, the church isn't thriving. It's declining. Right? If your gift is buried and someone else needs that gift in operation, uh, they're getting weaker along the way. And I'm not saying this to beat people up or make people feel bad or whatever, but here's one. How about this? Let's say God puts in your heart to become an intercessor, and you are called to spend like a good amount of time in prayer, and you, you just don't find the time, and you don't prioritize it, and you're not disciplined about it, and uh, you're meant to call down mercy in people's lives and, and call down breakthrough and blessing. And if you're not doing that, listen, the people you're called to pray for, they are suffering because you're not using that gift. That's just the reality. And, and so if we're, if we're not utilizing the gifts God has given us, 
Come on, the church is not uh, strengthened. It's not growing. We need help along the way. Hallelujah. Let me read another. Uh, let me make this statement again. The church is where spiritual growth takes place. Here's another verse from Psalm 92. It says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. Let me just highlight that. They will flourish in the courts of our God. You know, um, when I find myself planted and anchored in the context of church, I will grow spiritually. And the church is actually like a garden where I grow. It's vital. The community of people is vital for my growth. Hallelujah. And, and many times the reason our Christian life is static and, and, we re, and we're not growing the way we want is because we remain disengaged. We keep people at arm's length and we don't have people to challenge us or nurture us or encourage us. And uh, sometimes, you know, I'll talk to somebody and say, hey, you know what? I've been just listening to, uh, I've been going to church online. I've just been listening to the podcast every week. And it's like, it's a little interesting because that person would define church as hearing a sermon. I mean, that, that's a little piece of it, but come on, that, that's not what church is. Church is a group of people planted together, and every time the church comes together, it's not just there to receive, 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 but to give, to find people, to find a way to serve, and to give. Hallelujah. So let's not get disengaged. And listen, I'm not talking about Wellspring Worship Center. There are great churches in the Upper Valley. If you feel like this maybe isn't the best church for you, I would encourage you, get planted in some church. Of course, we'd love it to be Wellspring, but get planted is the key, hallelujah, because you will flourish in that role of being planted. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And, I, and like I want to say again, I'm not discounting some really bad experiences and for those of us who've been around for a long time, we've seen the good and the bad and the ugly. Oh, my gosh. Karen and I could tell you really bad stories. I mean, we've been around a little bit. Some of you have been around a little longer than us. But here's the thing. My commitment is not to broken down systems and broken down leaders. My commitment is to this vision Jesus has for his church that he loves and that he gave his life for and that he promises will not uh, bow to the powers of darkness and will make uh, progress through history. Hallelujah. Let's stay committed to that church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Here's the, here's the last promise in this passage of uh, Psalm 92. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. I just like that. I like being fresh. I like to chew gum sometimes. I just like fresh bread, mints. I like being fresh. Come on. And green, alive, life. Don't allow the enemy to isolate you. Don't, don't, people say, you know, I got hurt in the church, and, and so therefore I don't attend church anymore because I got hurt. For a mature Christian, you do actually don't have the option to say that. For, for an immature Christian, you do. For a mature Christian, you, you know, I got, I got messed up there and this went wrong and uh, there might be these dysfunctional churches around, of course, and you should probably leave them if they're dysfunctional, but God does not want any of us disconnected from his body of believers. Praise God. The breakthrough that you need, the favor that you need, the healing perhaps, the gifts working through us, come on, we can find them in the body of Christ. The church is where spiritual growth takes place. Is this making sense to anybody here today? Yes. Come on, here's the last point. Uh, the church is the bride of Christ. Maybe we can ask Dale if he can come out and play here on this last point. So we're not um, disregarding the church. We're not disregarding the bride. Some people think this. Jesus is amazing. He's like a required class. But the church is kind of an elective and optional. And it's sort of like, you know, you can't actually be close to the Lord and be in total opposition to his bride doesn't work that way. Every married couple gets this. If someone comes to me and says, Craig, you know, hey, I really like hanging out with you. You're a good dude, but here's the deal, dude. I, I can't stand your wife. Here's the deal. Uh, we're not going to be good friends uh, at, at all. I mean, we're not going to hang or nothing. And if someone says, Craig, I love you, but not so much your wife. It actually usually goes the other way with Karen and I, but, but whatever. <laughs> but... Um, we just can't say, Jesus we love in the church we sort of tolerate or it's sort of optional. No, it doesn't work that way. When we love Christ, when we love the Lord, we will develop a love for his church. Hallelujah. In the final analysis, anyway, it's not about an organization or human plans to pull stuff together. and what. It's actually about a romance. It's about the father preparing a bride 
for his son. And I don't know if you've read the book of Revelation lately, but there's this dinner coming, this marriage supper of the Lamb it talks about, where the desire for all that you've ever wanted, the things of this earth will never fully satisfy you. But, but there's a, a marriage supper of the Lamb that's coming where the people on earth cry out to God and heaven cries out. And here, here are some of the verses of it in Revelation 19. It says, Then I heard again what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of a mighty ocean waves, or the crash of loud thunder. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the holy, or the good deeds of God's holy people. And then verse 9 here says, And the angel said to me, Write this, blessed are those who are invited to this wedding feast. And he added, These are the true words that come from God. These are God's true words. This is, this is where every believer is heading, folks. There is a huge wedding feast in the future that we're all preparing for. It's all about the, the Son of God and the bride that he's been looking for, the church itself. Hallelujah. So in these last couple of minutes here, I just hope maybe we could just refocus who the church is. It's not an organization. It's not a denomination. That, that God had this holy, righteous jealousy for his bride. And he gets angry when people speak against it. He gets angry when people bring in the money stuff and all the money changers and when he threw those out of his temple. Let's just, let's just bow our heads here and we're gonna pray here. Father, we just ask for for the folks at Wellspring, that we would develop a new passion, a new commitment to the bride of Christ, which is the church. Hallelujah. It's the same commitment that Jesus has to the church. Hallelujah. Lord, help us to be friends of that bride. Help us to be a part of that bride, to love and respect and honor that bride, that bride of Christ, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for everyone here that there would come a new desire to be planted in God's church, whether that's here at Wellspring or somewhere else. And if people are visiting from somewhere else, we just bless them and we're glad they're here. But Lord, for those of us here, help us get committed and help us get planted. And we expect to see growth. We expect to see breakthrough. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we're just not here to receive every Sunday. We're here to build. We're here to give. We're here to be committed and invested in things. Hallelujah. Lord, I just ask for a new level of people's giftings and abilities being used in this church. They wouldn't be buried. They wouldn't be dormant. Hallelujah. Well, you've given so many gifts to your people, Lord. We just pray for activation of those gifts. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, when we do that, we're just gonna sit back and watch what you can do. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we've just seen, we've seen trickles and flows of your presence and your spirit. We just believe there's meant to be just a, a huge release, a huge downpour and a huge revival. And it just needs all of us playing our role, being a part, connected and fit together as the body of Christ here. This local little expression of Wellspring Worship Center. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.